Good afternoon, and welcome to our panel discussion on antimicrobial resistance, or AMR. I am Sarah Fortune. I'm chair of the Department of Immunology and Infectious Diseases here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And joining me for today's conversation are Henry Skinner, CEO of the AMR Action Fund, and Akila Kosaraju, president of Fair Bio, a biotech using AI to discover new antibiotics. And joining us remotely from Nigeria is Wande Elimi. Hello, Wande. Um, the anti the antimicrobial resistance program coordinator for the African CDC's um, uh, for the African CDC in Ethiopia and co-lead of the African Union Task Force on AMR. So thank you all for being here today. The World Health Organization has said that AMR is one of the greatest th threats to global health. And I'd like to start by setting the stage with a look at how critical this threat is with a trailer from BBC Stor StoryWorks brand film, Race Against Resistance. Today, the World Health Organization said the greatest disease threat is not Ebola or AIDS, but bacteria that resist antibiotics. What world are we going to give our children if we've lost all the antibiotics and they go back to dying of a scratch they got in the garden when playing? I was just really feeling quite unstoppable. <laughs> But within a week, I was fighting for my life. We've gone through a lung transplant and the number of surgeries and infections. And you're sitting there thinking, your infection? Drugs that we've relied on don't work anymore. I am concerned we could go to a post-antibiotic era. And that means modern medicine would go out of the window. The window. It's hard on patients and families. It's hard on physicians. We will enter a crisis. This was a bug that was resistant to virtually everything. Now what do you do? We are sitting on a time bomb. AMR is one of the most significant existential threats to humanity. So thank you to BBC StoryWorks for sharing that clip. The Race Against Resistance is now streaming on YouTube. So let's talk a, a little bit about antimicrobial resistance, how we got here and where we're going. And in our pre pre preparatory conversations, we framed it as sort of a two-sided problem, the emergence of resistance and then the paucity of new antibiotics. And I was wondering if we could ask you each to start framing that conversation for us and provide a little bit of a roadmap of where we're going today. And Henry, I'm going to ask you to start. Sure. <clears throat> Let me start by, by framing the problem. Um, <clears throat> in the 40s and 50s and 60s, we had a really miracle period of antibiotic development. And, and these drugs, probably the most impactful class of drugs we have, uh, allowed us to really set up our, our healthcare system as we know it today to treat infections that had been the leading causes of death in the country and around the world, to treat them effectively. Um, and, and that period really allowed us to explore other aspects of healthcare that we take advantage of today, from simple surgeries, uh, cesarean sections, um, chemotherapy, et cetera. And we've come to think of these drugs as there forever <clears throat> and not a problem. But as we use antibiotics, pathogens develop resistance and these drugs are no longer as effective as they once were and the threat reemerges. Fast forward to today uh, and we have somewhere between 35 and 50,000 people in the U.S. who die every year from AMR, probably another 50,000 from C. diff, a secondary consequence of the use of antibiotics probably 1.3 million around the world. So this is not distributed equally uh, across the globe. Um, and probably 5 million or so that <clears throat> are impacted by AMR. 
And the projections are by 2050, if we don't address this problem and stay ahead of it, 10 million people will die around the globe annually to the, uh, and cost the economies of the world trillions of dollars. So th this problem has been growing uh, and has really become acute and a crisis uh, from where we are today. And that's the, the underlying issue that we're trying to deal with. Wanda, in framing the problem, what would, what would you like to highlight as sort of the, the starting point for your thinking about AMR? Um, a really good insight, and I definitely agree that in terms of where AMR is across the globe, um, in terms of the vulnerable population, um, the low and middle income countries are definitely most at risk. I think over my 13 years or so and in discussing antimicrobial resistance, um, initially uh, our narrative was always around misuse and overuse of antibiotics, which is correct. But I say that uh, a lot of the issues that contribute to antimicrobial resistance are really um, deep-seated health systems issues. When you think around um, reducing infections, uh, I mean, the lesser infections we have, the less use of antimicrobials we will be needing. So things like the gaps around infection prevention and control are uh, thinking around um, very vulnerable population even using neonatal sepsis as a use case in terms of um, um, uh, uh, kids uh, little babies born um, less than 20, 20 days and not even getting that uh, jump start in life uh, when we think about things around wash um, things around diagnostic capacity i think one of the greatest gaps um, um, which we have been able to highlight with the work we are doing at africa cdc is really the systematic gap around diagnostic capacity it's impossible to estimate the burden of AMR. It's impossible for clinicians to prescribe um, adequately if there's no access to essential things like uh, point of care testing or even bacteriology uh, within uh, within the countries. Uh, our recent study um, coming from Africa uh, shows that only 1.3 or a percent of the 14 countries where we did a, a multi-year, multi-country AML data collection had the capacity for bacteriology. Uh, we estimate that by 2050, if nothing is done, we estimate that over 10 million Africans, over 100 million Africans, I, I beg my pardon, uh, would, would not have access to diagnostic capacity. Uh, rightly so, uh, it means that there's gonna be a lot of over-the-counter consumption of antimicrobials, uh, there will be a lot of self-prescribing, and of course, our clinicians will continue to prescribe blindly. Um, so a lot of the problems or the contributing factors for antimicrobial resistance, um, uh, resistance, uh, uh, particularly in lower middle-income countries, are primarily driven uh, by the gaps in um, um, universal health coverage, as well as the whole system's health strengthening um, approach, which Africa CDC is really pushing. Back to you. Wanda, thank you. Okay, so a problem with emergence, a problem with emergence in the context of the glo global healthcare. Akila, now frame the problem of solutions. Well, first of all, thank you for including me in this esteemed panel. I think it's really um, unusual to be able to get these three different perspectives and, and have um, Sarah's you know, deep uh, medical expertise behind this. Um, so you can see how this problem hits every aspect of the health system. And what we're trying to do at FAIR is really take it on at the earliest stages. So um, using AI for antibiotics, we feel that it addresses a very particular part of the problem that is amenable to solutions, which is the need for novel antibiotics. So as Henry mentioned, in the 40s to 60s, this was really the golden era, uh, where we had 26 new antibiotics developed in 20 years. Um, it was sort of galvanized uh, by World War II, um, and there was a really major uh, public-private investment and focus on this problem. Um, as you all know, it's very difficult to get you know, people to focus on any one given problem uh, for long periods of time uh, currently. And I think that we're really hitting this point that, that um, Henry was speaking to, an inflection point where we could get ahead of this and not get to this 10 million deaths by 2050. In our case, we think that by developing novel antibiotics using AI, and I can speak to a little bit more about how that process works a little bit later in the conversation, um, you can then really uh, hone in on one of the key problems, which is that many of the drugs right now 
being developed are what you would kind of call Me Too compounds. So they're combinations of existing mechanisms of action, beta-lactams, beta-lactamase inhibitors, some of the same mechanisms of action back in the golden age of antibiotics. What you absolutely need now is new mechanisms, true novel chemical spaces to work with, and that's why we're trying to use computational tools to address this. So we feel that this is very much a solvable problem with another uh, you know, public, private, philanthropic investment in the space, but at the same time, modernizing it with the technologies we can bring to bear to reduce costs, to increase precision, and also to increase scale across vast chemical spaces. So our feeling is, and I know Henry and, and Yuande and Sarah, that, that this is solvable in the long run, um, but, but there's a critical period right now where, where we must act and, and you know, thankful to the BBC StoryWorks uh, folks and, you know, and, the, and the, all the sponsors for highlighting this right now because I think there's definitely some fatigue around infectious disease coming out of COVID, um, all of our lives you know, really getting um, halted for that period of time. I think there's a sense, understandably, that can we move on to something else? And I think in the meantime, AMR has only increased. There was actually a 15% increase in uh, you know, superbug infections during COVID. So, um, it, it's, it's not only urgent from a, a broad perspective, but in an acute sense, we're actually, uh, you know, the crisis is actually um, accelerating. So um, both problematic, but at the same time, uh, very hopeful that, that we can enter into a new era um, in addressing it. Okay. So with that very broad framing, actually, I was wondering if we could just take a minute and put a little bit more human face on what AMR is. And maybe one day I will ask you to very briefly just describe the people for whom this is an issue. Uh, what does it look like on a, at a human level um, to be confronted with one of these uh, antimicrobial infections? Um, so this has been the toughest part of our job um, working in AML space. Um, AMR seems very distant and very far away for everyone. But I like to say to everyone, and this is what I say to policymakers, experts, is AMR is simple. I mean, putting a human face on it, it means that there's a possibility that you could go get a cesarean section. And knowing that um, uh, you're expected to be discharged in 48 hours at the most, uh, but there's a chance that a mother could lose a baby. There's the cost of life means the longer hospital stay out of pocket. Who bears the bronze? The patient. It means the quality of life. Um, if you think about it in the agriculture sector, what happens to the farmer? Uh, it means that um, many more animals have infections. The costs. Um, for many people, um, um, those cows are the money that they have. Um, the cattle, the sheep, that is their source of income. Means that they lose that source of income. So for me, AMR, um, when you put a human face, is, is the cost in terms of the price. I think about uh, the economic impact. You possibly lose your job because you're stuck in the hospital uh, for places that don't have a strong uh, provision to care for that. The children that have to die uh, because um, the, they pick up infections uh, from the hospitals. Uh, the farmer that was gonna lose his uh, source of income that is what AMR is, um, really affecting everyone, um, really affecting the rich, the poor, everyone. There's no discrimination. Uh, so that is what AMR is, um, and that's how I, I put a human face to antimicrobial resistance. Back to you. Thank you very much. Henry, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? I, I do, and, and I think those, those are great points and puts a human face on it. I, I think one of the challenges, though, um, is that while the pathogens don't discriminate, um, certainly the way we've, we've set ourselves up in society um, does make the most vulnerable of us particularly susceptible um, for a variety of reasons, from the social determinants of health to those who, who are aged, who are going through chemotherapy, who are otherwise uh, suffering disabilities and other things that simply makes them more vulnerable to being infected um, not getting the treatment they need um, and ultimately having a, a drug resistance infection which is extremely difficult to treat um, with high morbidity and mortality uh, that that can impact anyone but it clearly 
does not impact everyone the same. Um, and those are things we need to address as well. Um, but, but you know, people undergoing chemotherapy are particularly susceptible, people who require transplant and need to be on immunosuppressants, people who have autoimmune diseases are more susceptible. Um, simply as we age, we become more frail. If we don't take the vaccines we need to deal with viral infections, we get a secondary bacterial infection that, that often is extremely dangerous and can be drug resistant. Um, and while it can hit anybody, you can be in the garden and get pricked by a rose and get a drug resistant infection. It's the most vulnerable among us who are truly most susceptible, not only in the U.S., but around the world. And Wanda, I think this is a perfect um, segue into the framework that the African CDC has developed to prevent and control infections. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how this framework works to establish patient safety and com combat AMR. Um, at Africa CDC, um, just to introduce, um, we are an autonomous uh, public health agency of the African Union. Uh, the African Union is the strongest political um, organization across the Africa uh, continent, uh, representing 55 countries. Uh, so our role as Africa CDC, uh, we have been able to develop what we call the Africa CDC Infection Prevention and Control Legal Framework. Um, just to say that I'm uh, IPC, um, when it comes to AMR, is the single most cost-effective intervention for us to really um, mitigate this uh, very um, no longer silent pandemic, a uh, really pressing threat. So at Africa CDC, one of the things that we were able to do as uh, far back as 2017 is really identifying the fact that IPC could potentially put uh, um, a lot of low and middle income countries ahead of the curve when it comes to AMR. Um, in terms of um, lower the consumption of antimicrobials, reduce infections, um, uh, possibly also reduce um, um, healthcare associated infections, uh, very common a lot in uh, a lot of hospitals in Africa. Um, so one of the things that we did is really uh, looking at it from an ethical, moral pers uh, uh, perspective. Um, it, it is the right of everyone to um, receive safe, quality care. Um, so what we did, um, of course, with our AU countries um, was really look at the possibility of having a legal backing to infection prevention and control. This um, is the first of its kind across the world that has been done. But we realized that infection prevention and control for the past few decades has been very outbreak driven. It's been um, it's Ebola. We need um, to use our PPE. It's been COVID suddenly. We remember to wash our hands and use a face covering. And that has been the approach for addressing uh, the prevention of infections. Uh, but really, um, IPC really embodies ensuring that we have the strongest um, 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 requirement, the standards of offering um, care free of harm. So what we went on to do is really look at the possibilities of having stronger infection prevention and control programs across our countries by having a legal backing. Um, you wonder how is the legal backing uh, really going to do things? I always like to highlight how public health laws have really been able to change the landscape. I uh, think about uh, school vaccination programs. I uh, think about road uh, traffic uh, um, rules. I uh, think about things like control of infectious diseases where you have isolation quarantine laws in place. Uh, you have certain reportable diseases as a means to ensure that people are doing the right thing at every given time. So what we went on to do is really review the current gaps across the world. There is no legal backing. It is a moral imperative that everyone presenting to the healthcare facility is able to receive um, um, care free of harm, safe quality care. Um, so over the past um, four years or thereabout, we have been able to develop a legal backing that looks at the core components of infection prevention and control, and really put in place um, a sort of a, a model law that countries can then adopt. I'm quite pleased that I'm currently in Nigeria um, uh, this week uh, because we are supporting them to domesticate uh, this legal framework. What this means is that at every country level, not just patients, but healthcare workers, but the population is being protected by a certain law that can ensure that infection, the minimum standards for infection prevention and control are available, implemented, enforced 
at every given healthcare facility uh, to reduce infections and reduce the harm of antimicrobial resistance. Um, but most importantly, I thought to mention that one of the ways to make progress um, across the globe, we are seeing is that political commitment. So we're quite pleased that the ministers of health across the 55 countries were able to adopt this legal framework as a useful legal instrument to get countries to where they need to be. Even more so, the presidents of uh, uh, the countries across the African continent were also able to give that political buy-in. Means that countries can now start to progress towards ensuring that wash and thinking about water hygiene and sanitation, infection prevention and control, and even going so into vaccines as a means and to really drastically reduce infections and reduce the consumptions of antimicrobial resistance, and of course ensuring that we have a safer um, continent and a safer world. Back to you. Thank you, Wonder. Actually, Henry. Implicit in everything Wanda just said was the ability to um, see and track antimicrobial resistance. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about how that is done, what role surveillance <coughs> plays uh, in this battle. Absolutely. So surveillance is critical. We have to understand the problem, which pathogens are resistant to which drugs and why, um, where they are prevalent and how prevalent they are, and how that's changing over time. Uh, we need that anticipation in order to direct our resources, which are very finite, in the most effective way. Where do we need to intervene uh, on, on various dimensions? Where can a vaccine have greater impact? Where do we need to develop new antibiotics to treat a, a emerging pathogen that's resistant to the old ones? And if we don't understand how the world's changing, there's no way to get in front of the problem. And if we've learned anything with COVID, it's just how small the world is. It doesn't matter where resistance arises or where we find it first. It is ubiquitous and we all are at risk from it. And so we have a, a collective responsibility to maintain the public good that is antibiotics that is foundational for our healthcare system and, and to provide that you know, to ourselves and to the next generations, just as we've benefited from antibiotics developed in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, so this surveillance globally needs to be done, done better than it has been done. Um, we need to have the resources around the world to actually run these tests to understand the emergence, to direct our resources, and that's been woefully inadequate. Um, we know what we need to do. Uh, we certainly need better diagnostics that are more cost effective. We need to train the healthcare workers, our, our laboratory technicians, our microbiologists, and public health professionals to be able to address this problem. And that's a whole other issue. We're not training the next generation of people to, to manage this problem. And frankly, while the health ministers understand the consequences of AMR, the problems with the finance ministers, how do we resource? these incredibly important activities mm -hmm. uh, to understand the problem, to give our healthcare systems around the world the ability to reduce infection and to treat infections. And, and it's really a financing problem, not an understanding of the health risk. And it seems like in raising the financing problem, that might be a perfect pivot to, to thinking about the sort of the second side of this problem, which is the problem of the development of new antimicrobials. So since the 1980s, there's been a steady decline in the development of new antimicrobials. Um, let's see, Akila, uh, why? Mm -hmm. Why are it so few antimicrobials coming to market today? And what are the challenges that companies face in going into this market? Uh, yes, I mean, Sarah and, and Henry and Yuanda, you guys have hit on some of the key um, sort of necessary components of this whole health system. And of course, one of the major ones is actually developing these drugs. So to just to contextualize it, it takes about a billion and a half dollars a decade to develop a single antibiotic through to FDA approval. Um, the the uh, return on that investment typically is worthwhile in biotech. So if you have a drug that treats Alzheimer's or diabetes, you'll get billions of dollars um, in you know, market capitalization. Whereas in this case, the recoup on that investment is about $46 million per year. And so to actually have a return that's even slightly above what you put into these drugs, you need about 33 years. So that's, that's a very difficult argument for anyone in pharma or biotech to make 
to their investors, to their boards, uh, to carry these drugs forward. So oftentimes it becomes a passion project driven by a few stakeholders within, you know, a Merck or Pfizer or Shinogi or others. Um, thankfully, you know, those still exist, but it's a very difficult way to rely on actually developing the next generation of antibiotics. Um, I wanted to also make one point on uh, what Henry was mentioning in terms of having the data and the information available. So, you know, in, in our case, in using AI to develop new antibiotics, it's critical that we understand what is the current threat. And I also think this is an advantage of having a platform technology. And I think, again, you're seeing this in many other aspects of biotech um, and pharma that platforms are playing a bigger role. So we saw it with COVID, with mRNA platforms that have been in development for you know, over a decade and then finally pivoted to be um, extremely useful very quickly during COVID. In our case, we feel the same about AI, um, but at the same time, there isn't that level of investment that we need um, to be able to pivot quickly in the case of um, some kind of resistant outbreak that you know, goes global, as they often do. Um, so I think what would be helpful is both having investment at a market resource development level, uh, but also having the information to understand what are the threats that we need to be most focused on. What we often do is look at the lists of uh, you know, WHO, CDC's highest priority pathogen, so Acinetobacter pseudomonas, Klebsiella. Um, you often see these mentioned um, in the context of uh, you know, truly drug-resistant infections. Um, but beyond that, I think we're always hungry for what can we best train our AI on to be the most useful currently? Because now we have that capability, we can do it very quickly. Um, so I think that that information loop, to the extent that we can close it even more, um, we now actually have the power to use that information in real time in a way that we never used to be able to. So I think the surveillance, these networks, um, the communication um, is all the more important. And then, you know, I know we'll get into the, invest, uh, the incentive side, but the market, uh, the uh, development funding, I mean, it's all part of this cohesive system that um, is crucial that, you know, we continue to build the train while we're, while we're running the train. Okay. So I don't think the average person understands what drug development circa 1980 looked like or, or what AI, you know, chat GPT <laughs> is doing to that process. Yeah. So could you just, like, expand on that a little bit, just what was it and then what is sort of the AI enabled future? Absolutely. So I know, I, th I feel like now when it, people hear AI, they think we're training a large language model across all of the craziness on the internet to develop a new antibiotic. That it's, very, it's actually quite a little bit different than that. Uh, so traditional drug development, you typically have, um, it's, it's very based on wet lab work. You know, you are doing what's called high throughput screening across, uh, you know, basically wells of um, compounds and, and, uh, and, and compounds and, and pathogens and seeing what ultimately is effective. It's a very labor intensive process. More recently, they've uh, incorporated robotics into it that's accelerated it somewhat. But in terms of the computational tools, now it's many orders of magnitude more sophisticated. So just to simplify it, what we do with AI in, in antibiotic development, um, in discovery in particular, is we train an uh, AI model on what an antibiotic against a particular pathogen looks like. So for example, Pseudomonas, one of the most difficult uh, pathogens to treat. Um, with that training, so instead of a large language model across the entire internet, we're training on compound structures that these tend to be effective against Pseudomonas. Um, with that trained model, you then comb across billion plus data sets, uh, some of them here at uh, the, Broad and MIT, uh, the Broad and Harvard and MIT, um, we actually, our, our main partner in this whole effort is Jim Collins, uh, uh, you know, a very renowned professor here who started in earnest really this entire field of AI for antibiotics. Um, so in his lab, he trains the AI, combs across these massive data sets of compounds. Typically these are drug repurposing libraries where compounds are coming out of pharma or um, have been tried in research labs and for whatever reason have been discarded. They're then placed in these libraries and then you identify these un, unknown um, antibiotics. So in our case, we've now used this for two breakthroughs. One was a drug that was previously studied for uh, as an anti-diabetic. One was an anti-hypertensive, both back um, in the 80s and 90s. And we found very unexpectedly that they have uh, you know, surprisingly potent 
antibiotic properties. So you can find these kind of diamonds in the rough and the other great thing about it is sometimes they have data behind them and may, may have even gone through some clinical trial so you can really accelerate the process. We're now taking that to the next level, which is a little closer to what we're hearing in the news now uh, in terms of generative AI. So where you train the model on what's effective against a particular pathogen, but then you actually generate de novo compounds. Um, so you're, you're getting into a, a great new world of novelty in terms of chemical space. So we're not just trying to attach a fancy new technology to antibiotics. There's really three good reasons why this is a really nice fit in particular for antibiotics. One is that the novelty um, you know, challenge and that you can really train the model on finding novel chemical space. So don't find exactly what you train the model on. Find things that are different from that but, but related. So, so you get into novelty. The second is you have a feedback loop. So with a lot of AI for drug discovery and development, it's tricky because ultimately you still need to get the drug into a human uh, clinical trials. In this case, you can quickly test in a Petri dish and see if the, your hypothesis coming out of the AI works. Um, and then the third is precision and scale. So precision, I would say, cost and scale. So just the uh, efficiencies of using computation versus using you know, strictly humans in a wet lab and you know, with some robotics um, added on. One quick, thing I wanna, one quick point I wanna make is that you can't just rely on computation. This is very much hand in hand with biologists. Um, so in the labs that we're working with, Jim Collins and John Stokes, who's in the BBC documentary at, at McMaster, um, they, are, they have the expertise both from a uh, microbiology perspective and an AI perspective so they can combine those skills and really use that human uh, expertise to train the AI. Similar to, you know, with ChatGPT, they have, you know, thousands of people around the world who are actually helping to train. I think you'll never lose that, that human component where you have to have expertise that's really situated for exactly what you're trying to uh, build a tool around. Okay. So, AI miracles. We have new <laughs> drugs. Um, how are we going to ensure that they remain um, affordable and that we ensure equitable access, especially as Wanda mentioned, in low and middle income countries? And one day, I'm actually going to pitch that to you. Um, I think it's quite important that we remember that when it comes to health outcomes, equity should be the baseline of everything we do. Um, as we raise, it, um, raise to develop um, new and novel antimicrobials, and that's been rightly said, um, I think uh, AMR is borderless, so just like COVID-19 and a lot of other infectious diseases that we are seeing. So I think one thing that is quite crucial is ensuring that um, uh, um, we, ins we have um, 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 a lot of low and middle income countries have access to this. Uh, one of the major ethical dilemmas for a, a continent like Africa, and I reckon that it's, it's similar in some part of the uh, 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 some part of, um, um, of the rest of the world. Thinking about South uh, East Asia, uh, some parts of Asia as well are reporting this is the balance uh, when you think about antimicrobial access versus uh, access. Um, um, a lot of, um, at population level, many vulnerable groups still do not have access to the essential um, existing antimicrobials. So one of the crucial things is really ensuring that there is representation. I think one of the things that we are championing as Africa CDC is ensuring that when it comes to the global R&D development and movement, um, there is representation of a lot of more low and middle income countries. Um, remember, in, in terms of uh, even using AI, a lot of it is very heavily dependent on the data. Um, it's quite impossible to uh, develop uh, uh, new drugs or antimicrobials uh, that, can, um, 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 that are um, that are efficient without consideration of the data coming, AML data coming from other settings. So it's important that when um, antimicrobials are being developed um, and produced, we really address issues of equity access. At Africa CDC, we have introduced what we call the new public health order, and that is, um, um, you can look it up, it's really to put in pillars that really ensure that we embrace and implement equity when it comes to global health. Uh, primarily, uh, we are also championing a lot of movement around local manufacturing. Um, if you think about the work that we have done with the COVID-19 
and vaccine local manufacturing. Uh, I need not to talk a lot about the, the gaps around, the widened gaps around vaccine access when it came to COVID-19. We envisage that when that novel antibio antibiotic is being developed or is developed, they those gaps will definitely uh, 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 widen because, I mean, um, those countries may not have access or purchasing power for this uh, new, new novel antimicrobials. So primarily, we are really championing that move um, for expanding local manufacturing of um, um, therapeutics such as antimicrobials uh, within the African continent. And there, there's a need to move a lot around the um, the North-South uh, collaboration when it comes to things like uh, technology transfer uh, for local manufacturing. But beyond that, things like pool procurement is an approach that we are definitely championing. And uh, we have seen that when it comes to pool uh, procurement as a continent, we are able to re remarkably re reduce that cost. Um, so a few things um, are really uh, to tie down, down is um, that need to ensure that a lot of uh, low, um, low and countries have I'm sorry, can I interrupt? I just, um, I see my time here. And it's making me a little nervous because I realize actually how much we have to get through in the next 15 minutes. So I'm gonna ask you to hold that thought just for a minute um, to, to highlight this issue of manufacturing that really, um, and local manufacturing as a key pillar uh, in terms of ensuring access. And then before we, um, uh, lose track of the other um, major initiatives um, around ensuring, trying to change the market dynamics, I do want to highlight the Pasteur Act. So the Pasteur Act is currently before Congress. It, is, uh, it has been introduced by uh, Representative Drew Ferguson from the 3rd Congressional District in Georgia, and it is trying to create a marketplace for new antibiotics through a government subscription model. And we have a brief clip of Re Representative Ferguson describing this. So why don't we run this clip, please? What the subscription model does is that it almost guarantees a marketplace, or at least a stability in the marketplace for these products by allowing the, U the, the U.S. government to buy these products um, in, a, in, a, in a markedly reduced rate. And if you think about it, where would we use these? We would use these in um, pandemic preparedness. We would use these in the VA and the Department of, De of Defense, just to name a few. Medicare, obviously a huge component of our healthcare system. All of these would be able to buy these, these, these novel drugs at a reduced rate. That does a couple of things. Number one, it gives assurances that if, if I invest billions of dollars in developing a new antibiotic, that there will be a marketplace for it. That's important. Number two, ultimately, this creates a tremendous amount of savings to the healthcare system, both in terms of dollars and in terms of lives. If you look at the overall cost to the healthcare system, I mean, th these numbers are, you know, uh, north of $5 billion a year to the system. Um, in, an, in an era where we need to be saving as much money as we can and using dollars in, a, in an efficient way, this ultimately could, could, could really impact the bottom line for healthcare in America, but most importantly, this would help save lives. Okay, Henry. <laughs> now, lightning round, can you explain the subscription model in two minutes or less? <laughs> I, I, I can, but, but first we need to understand the problem, which is a broken market for antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Antibiotics are unique in that the latest antibiotic we develop might work for all types of infections, but we don't want to use it where the old antibiotics work because we don't want resistance to the new antibiotic. So that means we hold it in reserve. We, we put it behind glass, and only in an emergency do we break the glass, which means in the way we run healthcare and pharmaceuticals, where we reward uh, the value of a drug based on the volume that we use. For public health reasons, we absolutely need to not do that with antibiotics or we're going to make them not effective for the next generation. So that means the market doesn't work. There isn't a return on investment and what Pasteur does or a subscription model and the UK's done one that, that has been rolled out is it recognizes the value to the healthcare system of new antibiotic. And if we think about penicillin discovered in the 1920s, we still use it today. A hundred years of value to public health, and we're gonna use it for the next 100 years. 
the latest antibiotic we're going to use for 100 years. But how do we incentivize people to invest in this risky science, to take AI and, and to convince our, our brilliant scientists who can deliver such great public health benefits in other areas of healthcare to work in this space where we need them? And, and this is a poll incentive or, or switch model which says, if you make a good new antibiotic, we guarantee there will be some money to return on that investment to make sure that we have this available as a public good for patients. Um, and, and so that insurance, if you will, that there's an investment, then incentivizes investors to take the risk to, to, for scientists to commit their, their uh, life and, and um, uh, resources to make these new antibiotics to bring them to patients. And that insurance, if you will, allows us to continue to maintain antibiotics as a public good and not erode them and really put our, our physicians uh, behind the curve in, in being able to treat infections in their patients. So Akila, a market guarantee, is that enough? Do we need anything more in terms of uh, kick-starting antibiotic development? Well, you know, Henry said this, um, first of all, this is a beautiful description of, of sort of the, the problems and, and where we kind of need to go in the market. Um, and why this has happened, I, you know, I think there's what we've noticed on the earliest stage side is that, you know, first of all, I, I think most people would not associate antibiotics and innovation, right? Those two words are sort of not completely aligned. Um, and, um, you know, and that's partially because it's such an old technology and many people feel that this has been solved, um, including in how doctors prescribe, right? So it's easier to take the cheaper antibiotic off the shelf and have, you know, a little bit of stewardship around it, but that's the easiest path instead of requesting the novel antibiotic and all the reimbursement concerns around that. Um, in terms of the, your question, Sarah, we think that that's uh, necessary to have this kind of subscription model. Absolutely, if there's one thing the industry can do, that's the one, because it actually pulls other people through this development process with some kind of um, incentive at the end, so you shift that dynamic around this $46 million per year in return, and it actually can get a return on your investment, so that's absolutely critical. I would say in the earliest stage side, there still is a need for funding of development. Um, so thankfully, there are later stage uh, development opportunities like the AMR Action Fund, GARDP, CARBEX. Um, you know, there, there are, once you get through preclinical development, get into clinical trials, we feel that there actually is a great deal of support um, of course, that could always be increased, but right now that's, that's not our most critical problem we feel in terms of development. It's really in the earliest stages where the risk is the highest, the innovation potential is also the highest, um, but the failure rate you know, is, is substantial. So coming out of a, just a discovery process, there's a one in a thousand success rate, rate for any drug across um, the industry. So how do we get venture capitalists, philanthropists, government, um, you know, stakeholders to actually focus on those earliest stages so that we have an active pipeline for 10, 15, 20 years, not just solving for the next five years with, you know, some compounds and clinical trials. So as we've combed across the this space, we found that that's a critical missing link. Again, why we've gone to philanthropists to fill, to, f to bridge what, you know, many people call this valley of death in drug development between academia and getting into clinical trials. Um, and we think that's a critical piece that also needs a lot of thinking around how do you get more uh, public investment. Okay, and then before I ask you for sort of final future looking thoughts, I just wanna, we've touched on this issue of money and we've touched on the issue of manufacturing. Is there anything else in the policy space that's needed in terms of either driving future development or actually protecting the antibiotics that we are, already have? And Henry, I'll let you take that. Yeah, no, uh, briefly. Anyway. Thank you. I, I think we need to remember this is both a big problem with a lot of issues that come into play that we need to think about, and it's a global problem. So issues of access to new antibiotics, and it's not just the north-south divide. Of the last 18 antibiotics approved in the U.S., only two were launched in Canada, and one of those was a 30-year-old antibiotic. Mm -hmm. Only five were launched in Denmark and Japan. We have access issues all over the place, and, and the solution needs to be global. We need to think about this holistically. We need to use antibiotics appropriately. We need to have diagnostics. We need to have uh, basic health care and hygiene and clean water, 
right, to prevent infections, better vaccines, and to get those around the world where the patients need them most. We need to think about antibiotics in agriculture and, and not misuse them there. Uh, ethical manufacturing of antibiotics where we're not putting into rivers uh, antibiotics that then drive resistance locally. So there's a lot we need to do. This problem is big, it's global, uh, much like global warming. There's a lot of places we can make a difference and we need to address each of those so that holistically we're actually elevating the solution and not adding to the problem. Okay, so um, actually in the final couple of minutes here, I wanted you to ask you each to look forward and, um, and I'm gonna start with you, Wanda, and I don't know whether, I'm gonna nest in that another question, which is, as you look forward and as we collectively look forward, what makes you hopeful? And then what would you like to see the general public, us, do in terms of uh, furthering your agenda? So I think I'm quite hopeful to have conversations like this, uh, really important in raising the awareness, highlighting the innovative solutions uh, such as AI, understanding what is being done across um, the various parts of the world. I think for the first time um, across the world, there's a movement where we all collectively take action together. I'm quite hopeful in knowing that in five years, if we keep this momentum, we will significantly reduce the impact of AMR. But most importantly, we will be closer to getting new antimicrobials uh, for our generation, for the future generation, and ensuring that we keep this very scarce resources, very scarce limited resource antimicrobials, we can keep it safe and ensure that we have a safer globe. Um, I think um, those are the words that I have got in terms of how hopeful I am in the conversations. And I think in, in terms of what can the um, general public do. It's time to realize that antimicrobial resistance is not just something very away from you. It might be faceless, but it has implications. Um, think about not conflicting your dose. It's com you're contributing to it. Uh, I think we must understand that one, each and every one of us is responsible. The safety and of antimicrobials, us reducing AMR is really dependent on you, on me, every one of us, we have a part to play. Uh, so I think we need to really unless the roles of the general public, really make the messaging clearer and definitely hopeful for a safer uh, world. Back to you. Okay, Henry, what makes you hopeful as you look forward? Uh, I, I think a number of things. We've seen progress in the UK from a, a pilot program to something rolled out on a more permanent basis to help incent uh, innovation in the space. Uh, the WHO and countries with national action plans that, that are articulating what they need to do to improve their situation as a homegrown solution. Uh, those need to be financed, so we still have a ways to go. Uh, Japan has started a pilot program, subscription model-like thing. That's encouraging. Canada may do something. So at the Pasteur Act in the U.S., uh, where we have a bicameral um, bipartisan proposal to address the problem is all very encouraging. Great momentum, uh, recognition of the G7 and G20 health ministers of how important this problem is. Uh, so, you know, so looking back three, four, five years, we did not have this momentum. All of this is great. There's more to do, uh, but I think as we recognize the problem and as we give thought to it, um, you know, things are, I think, encouraging that we are collectively looking at solutions globally and trying to address the fundamentals of the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Akila? Well, you know, in addition or adding on to um, what Henry mentions about momentum, we also very much see that. Um, I would say there's two other areas that give me a lot of hope. One is talent. Um, we are often approached by uh, younger talent at bastions of brilliance like Harvard um, and uh, places like this that are really having a focus, you know, I think on this kind of issue. Um, and, uh, and also having these new tools be brought to bear um, on this challenge is, I think, exciting. Many people who ordinarily would not be interested in this space. Just to give you an example, many of our funders are coming out of technology. They're co-founders of, you know, major uh, technology companies and, you know, uh, Richard Branson and other folks like that. Um, and so I think it's, it's brought um, a broader coalition together. Um, but I think also on the talent front, 
Um, there's a thirst to be in this space. I think the question is how do you make it economically viable for an individual? And I think those problems will start to be solved as the incentives, the poll incentives become um, more favorable that actually people need to be able to you know, have a salary and be able to eat and still do this kind of work passionately. So tech, the, the talent, and then the second is, of course, the technology, which we talked about. Um, I really think that we're at this unique moment where technology is being scaled across so many different areas, and AMR could capture that and quickly. And I think we are about to start to see that. Okay, so that's all the time we have this afternoon. Um, it was a pleasure to moderate this conversation. Thank you for joining me. Um, if you missed any part of this program or want to re-watch it, a recording will be, will be available on YouTube soon. And I am Sarah Fortune. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Thank you.